because I saw his, uh, his co-founder, Andy Hobsbawm, give a fantastic talk at um, the IAB Gage conference last year. That was why I wanted to, to get everything here to talk to you all today. Um, and so, no, over to you. Thank you very much. So being in the magic circle, I should make some naff joke about magic, right? So I don't actually have to give you a presentation. Look into my eyes, look into my eyes. You've had a great presentation. Any questions? Yeah. So, um, so I have the, the task of explaining the Internet of Everything to you in a, in a few minutes. Um, to just set some context, so back in August uh, of 2010, um, there was a key moment on, uh, on, a, on a Tuesday, um, which, uh, which wasn't... Uh, anything interesting on the front page of the New York Times, but it was the day where more non-humans were connected to the, to the internet than, uh, than, humans, uh, than humans. And um, it was an interesting moment where, where devices became the, the dominant connectivity driver on the internet. And there are competing predictions for how many things will, uh, will be online by, by varying time frames. And it seems like every other month an analyst or a, or a, or a tech company wants to come up with a bigger number. So one trillion connected devices um, is IBM's prediction by 2015, which uh, you know, one could argue is actually a pretty conservative number um, when one starts to, 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 to try and question what connectivity means. But when the Internet of Things is, is spoken about, it's, it's generally spoken about in, in, the, in a context of, of engineering, um, of machine-to-machine -machine type of communication. And, and, uh, and so it's a very sort of robotic type of, uh, type of context. But... Um, I think that it's, it's important to think about it actually in the sense of what does it mean as, uh, to people, right? So as, as things come online, one of the consequences of connectivity or connectability appearing in physical objects around us is that they turn into interfaces. They turn into, into interaction points. And, uh, um, and that's a tremendously exciting and disruptive opportunity. I mean, this year, somewhere between 3.3 .3 and 3.5 billion sorry, trillion products will be manufactured and sold uh, around the world. And as those, uh, a, a fraction of those, probably somewhere in the order of, of, of only 100 billion or so this year, will, uh, will have connectivity and connectability associated with them. Those are all becoming media points. So I think that's an interesting, an interesting way to think about what the, what the Internet of Everything means. So Bruce Sterling, who's a sort of design god, as far as I'm concerned, made this, this comment a couple of years ago. And, it, and it, I think it, it, um, it talks to a very interesting perspective on what, what the Internet of Things should be, or maybe more accurately, what the Web of Things should be about. So in order for Bruce to be able to Google his shoes, right, it, it, it talks to a world where Bruce's shoes um, are able to be indexed by Google um, in a real-time way, whereby Google can say, hey, somebody's looking for you as a pair of shoes, where are you? Um, and they can understand, Google can understand that they're shoes, and it can also understand that they're Bruce's shoes. And it can understand specifically the relationship between Bruce's shoes in the, in the sense that should it tell this person that's run a query on Google where these shoes are, because maybe it's Bruce's girlfriend that's looking for the shoes and, and Bruce doesn't really want that answer to be, to be delivered, right? And finally, in a more sort of technological sense, the notion that the shoes are on the web, right? That they are an asset, an object that's sitting on the web in, uh, in the same way that a YouTube video would be sitting on the web or a Flickr image is sitting on the web and can be mashed up and interacted in that sort of flexible asset type of way. And to the, to the preceding presentation, which is brilliant, I think this, this notion of starting to think of physical objects as another data resource, another data asset that can be very flexibly used and therefore the data from it being networked is a, is, is a very powerful notion. So when we think about this interaction of human beings and, and physical things, we're starting to see some, some early examples of this del delivering new types of service interface, so the sort of connected car and, and some early projects um, in, in, in redesigning interfaces to, to, uh, to products or to services as a consequence of connectivity. So these are two fridge magnets, um, one uh, allowing you to order a pizza by pushing the fridge magnet, uh, and the other one allowing you to order a refill of your, of your, of your water by, by, by pushing, pushing the fridge magnet. But they're connected and they change the basis of interface between the, the brand and, and the customer because they're a connected device. And this, this, this statement by, by Nike 
um, really captures the, the opportunity value in that um, quite significantly. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a runner. Uh, I have vested a large amount of data over the years in my Nike Plus relationship with, uh, with, with, um, with Nike. And so I don't think of my next pair of running shoes as a brand new purchase decision. I think of that as an upgrade to the next model of running shoe because I've got a persistence of data relationship as a consequence of, of the fact that, that that's an ongoing uh, factor. And that's just a totally di different orientation uh, that has occurred. And it's a communication channel that the brand has established with me, which is pretty unique in a conventional sense of a, of a product manufacturer um, and, a, and a customer. So there's a sort of great frustration we should have about the physical things in the world, because the vast majority of physical objects are like offline static media, right? We're used to operating in a digital world where when you go to Amazon's homepage, it's totally personalized. It understands who you are. It adapts its content to you. It adapts its content to where you are, etc. All that contextual stuff is taken into, into account. But when I go out and get into my car or when I pick up a, a, a sporting good that I'm about to play with, there's absolutely no change in its behavior, its manifestation. It is a static object that does exactly the same thing all the time. And, uh, and, and so why, why can't we have those same digital capabilities or digital characteristics in, in physical objects? And, and that's, that's, uh, that's where the internet of, of, of things is starting to have some really interesting uh, effects. So I will, I will now attack you with the mandatory video. It's impossible to imagine life today without the smart digital technologies that connect us. And yet, when it comes to the physical things that we rely on every day, we still make do with products that are essentially dumb, unconnected. Of course, it doesn't have to be this way. Everything is a software engine that makes physical things smart by connecting them to the web. It means that any product can have its own digital profile, just like we do on social networks, which means you can connect with the things you own in a smarter way. Like warranties and manuals, or your camera suggesting where and when to get the perfect shots. Like a medicine bottle that reminds you when it's time to take the pills. Like a washing machine that can recommend a trusted local service agent when it needs fixing. If you're a brand, this means you can have direct one-to-one -one relationships with your customers through your products. And physical products can transmit a stream of data analytics based on how they are made, sold, and used. In short, Everything's technology connects products to the web to connect them more cleverly to people's lives, making brands come close. Oops, so I will leave the infomercial. Um, but the, 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 the commercial value opportunity uh, contend from a brand perspective of connectivity is this opportunity of, of brands to communicate directly with their customers. And, uh, and, and, and that is a, a hugely disruptive phenomena. Behind it is, is the idea of identifying things digitally. Um, so human beings now have digital identities. We were hearing about that in the preceding presentation. We have Facebook profiles. We have LinkedIn profiles. The existence of that data about us the persistence of it online, the fact that right now somebody can be doing something to my Facebook profile and explore, you know, leveraging that data and that presence, that has built a massive application ecosystem. Um, physical things, um, this lectern, currently are not present online. They do not have an addressable presence on, on the web. So the content, the information from and about this, where it is, what it's, what, what's happening to it right now, who's, who's here with it, and so forth, none of that content or information is currently present on the web. And that's what's, what's, what's starting to trans transition as we give physical things, digital identities in the web. And the technology that we're engaged with is specifically focused on that issue of how to give physical objects, a persistent uh, identity online. Once you have that, they're in the graph. They become uh, an asset in the graph, so the product graph, if you like. Um, and the data from and about those objects becomes leverageable. So we can start to build a kind of transactional environment. So if we think about a physical product being identified, if it's a refrigerator, it might have an embedded chipset in it. It's going to be persistently online. If it's a, if it's a, a you know, chocolate bar, um, it might have a unique QR code on it, but the, the point is that it's digitally identifiable. 
And human beings can identify themselves with their social network identities or their mobile network identities or what have you, which means that a digital transaction can take, between, it can take place between a, a, a human being and a, 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 and a product. So I can check into my product in the same way that I would check into a Foursquare location, for example, which means that I can take digital possession of, of something. Um, once I've engaged digitally with, I've friended my, uh, my chocolate bar, to, to, to use an extreme example, then I, I digitally own that asset. I can, can transact with it, right? Maybe that's leverageable for a loyalty program because we're measuring how many chocolate bars I have. Or maybe that's leverageable because actually I want to buy another one and I'll just use my digital interaction with this one to order another one, right? So all of a sudden, the vendor of the chocolate bar, bar can become an acquirer of purchase transactions, right? Why isn't the product a retail environment, yeah? And that, that, uh, that, that, that is a, 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 you know, a, a significant change in value chain. Of course, that means, because you, you can't build much electronics into a, into a, a 55 cent a chocolate bar, means a, a lot of that functionality augmenting the physical product happens online. It happens with, that, with that, the digital profile of that individual chocolate bar. Just like right now, functionality is available about me and is driving applications through my, through my social network profile. So if you think of, of products as having their own, their own digital life and, uh, and, and becoming um, the physical things, becoming triggers really for, uh, for, for other, other sorts of, 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 uh, of service and experience to augment uh, the, the, the physical product. That's, that's, I think, a way to think about the actual direct commercial application of, uh, of the Internet of Things uh, today. And that might be something incredibly simple, like you know, one of the projects we did uh, uh, some time back now was, was, was simply adding personalized videos to, to products so that per people could actually customize a product that they were purchasing with their own content uh, and, and, and turn that into a cool gift. Um, or it might be much more utilitarian in the sense that my fridge is broken and I don't know how to get the damn thing fixed and I don't know what the model number is because you know, I've lost the manual somewhere. So why can't I just ask the fridge uh, how to get itself fixed because it knows what its model is and it knows where it is and it knows who the repair agents are that within a certain striking distance of me. And that's a, that's a useful service relationship to, to deliver upon. So the broader commercial theater is what, what arising as a result of the Internet of Things is what we would call product relationship management. It's, it's a, 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 another layer, if you like, in the, in, in the marketing technology stack. And it, it ramps up this, this whole pool of data to do with what do we know about the individual interactions of the individual product assets that we have out there in the field and how do we use that as, a, as either a transaction acquisition point or a data acquisition point uh, to inform a customer interaction. And so products become a, a, a media channel, um, if you like, for, for the brand. Obviously, from the consumer's point of view, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a, a, an opportunity to deliver a whole new set of value in terms of, of experiences, so more to the product than, than meets the eye. And, and as, as, as a media platform, as I said just now, the, the product becomes a media platform for, for, for the brand. So, as we move towards a, a, a brave new world of, of, of smart products, I think it's, it's useful to look at how that, that sort of upgrades the, the, the notion that we have today of what a product is. So conventionally, we've, we've lived in an environment of, of mass production, that you know, we, we manufacture and ship uh, a million units or 10 million units or, or 2 billion units of a particular thing, and they're all exactly the same. So that, that's true in terms of the physical aspect of, of a product. But as we build a digital wrapping to, to, to that, products can become individually customized because digital experiences can be individually customized. And to refer back to, to, to Bruce Sterling, he, he coined an expression spines. And spines are, are hybrids of, of, uh, of physical, digital, but also temporal in the sense of the data that we have about this very moment shaping the functionality and behavior of, of something. And so a, a product being a combination of this digital and physical and data about the moment and the data about me can become a customized and personalized thing. Products no longer are only the, the, the analog offline standalone version of them. They are dynamic digital things as, as well. 
and connected either directly in the sense that there's a piece of silicon inside them and there's an internet connection hanging out the back of them and so forth, or indirectly because you know, I'm able to transact with it via my smartphone or connect with it using a, using a Bluetooth um, mechanism or, or scan it, for example, and therefore augment the functionality and capability of the physical product with, with what I'm bringing in my pocket, broadband internet connection and a GPS and, and, and a screen and so forth. And finally, you know, the, the, the notion that customers have to learn how to use a product um, can be inverted to a world where the product learns how to use the customer, right? So um, it can use the data that it's acquiring uh, from me and it can adapt its behavior to, to who I am and where I am and what I'm trying to do. And, uh, and so in terms of design guidelines and opportunity, if you like, when we reconceptualize what a product means to a consumer, um, I, I think it's this dynamicness that, that is the, the, the big change force. So that's a perspective on the internet of everything that I wanted to provide. Any questions? Or comments? We spelled it right. Everybody else has spelled it wrong. <laughs> it's tough to get a, a, a .com domain name these days. You know, you have to you have to take shortcuts. You know? <laughs> so there's a question over here. My question was about standards in the sense that you know nowadays you cannot get a big file from a Mac or PC, and I'm sure that would be difficult. Yeah. Pick well within Charizard. Would you make all those things, you know, connect and uh, especially I, I'm thinking not about the possibility, but the interest that will conflict uh, in making it uh, or in you know, certain you know, different how do you think all those companies or how would you do it for the Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's a tremendous mess, the short answer right now. But but uh so the the the, the focal points are, uh, I think, right now of, of confusion are to do with the semantics. How do we, how do we um, describe objects online so that applications can understand what they are and how to interact with them? If I want to talk to a fridge and say, turn yourself on, there's no, there's no agreed language right now of how you transmit that information, that, that instruction, if you like, the semantic of that instruction. But actually, there's a surprising amount of, of um, of, of resolution of the protocols of information exchange, RESTful APIs, for example, for, 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 uh, for data transfer and, and, and actual interaction from between, of applications with objects and, and, and so on. So I think the big, the big issue to resolve is, is purely the semantics, the actual data description languages. Out, out, uh, once we get over that, then, uh, then we've got some scalability. And uh, um, while there are a lot of standards initiatives, I suspect the real solution is going to arise much in the way that it did in, uh, in, in the, um, the last generation of the web, where a few successful tools became de facto standards, like Flash became a de facto standard um, for, for, for creating interactive media. And that's, that's likely, to be the case, uh, likely to be the case here. Yeah, I've got a question about, um, I guess, the impact of all this on consumer behaviour and how, um, I guess, in terms of, you can see how this is relevant for, you know, how what we're talking about before, um, and also like control, so climate change, um, mm -hmm. how, uh, you know, how it's going to become, you know, uh, wide, wider in control of everything, like the energy you use, the water you consume, all that sort of stuff. And I guess the impact on sort of how then consumers behave, just like, how you sort of see that happening? Could we have like city versus city? You know, who's most um, environmentally friendly? You know, who's, who's most energy efficient? Yeah, I mean, I, I, there is a tremendous opportunity for for affecting people's behaviour. I mean, at, at at one end of the equation, and we see some brands we're working with today trying to directly incentivise um, shifts in behaviour of the consumer. Um, as a way of, of differentiating their product, actually, and, and, uh, and anticipating certain regulatory effects that they're going, they're going to see. Like how efficiently am I using a cleaning product, right, for, for example? And how can we instrument the product in such a way that 
we can know how efficiently it's being used and we can incentivize the user to use it more efficiently because in time we expect that we're going to end up paying a higher cost in our supply chain if, if we don't uh, affect that, right? So that, there's, there's definitely that, that, uh, that opportunity. I, I don't know about sort of macro city organizations. Uh, I suspect that that will be more fragmented, yeah? But, but, but the, I think the, the sort of corollary issue is obviously personal data associated with all this, right? Because this future talks to an environment where there's an incredible amount of personal data vested in, in hundreds of, of micro relationships of a consumer with a product. And actually for any useful personalization uh, or, or response to occur for, for, for an end user or consumer, those, those, those bits of information have to combine with each other. My, my run keeper has to be able to tell my garage or whatever it is that I'm doing, that I'm doing something. And, and I think that's the big test is how we, how we can build the trust sustainably with the consumer that they're, uh, they're going to allow that personal information to be networked in, in, in that way. That's the radical uncertainty that exists in the space at the moment. Continuing on that theme, uh, with product relationship management, uh, there's huge amounts of new data that's going to be generated uh, about people and what they're doing. Whose data is it? Um, I suspect that it's, there isn't one owner to that, right? So, I mean, we're definitely, um, we, 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 we think that there's an inevitability to um, increasing amount of regulatory accountability um, on the part of brands as to how they manage that information. And obviously, the data ownership, to a large extent, vests with the consumer, actually. But, but the, uh, the use of it um, is actually where the risk lies. And, and, uh, and that sits with the brands, whether they like it or not, because they're the front end of, uh, of actually uh, the, how it's getting applied. So you know, I, I wouldn't like to take a position on who owns it. I think there's, there's, that's a complicated legal question, but I, I think that the, there's, who's responsible for it, I think is, a, is, is quite a, a specific issue, and that's, that, that lies with the brand. So how can, you capture, how can you build the trust with your consumer that you're going to be able to capture a lot of information and demonstrably apply value from that information so that you'll be able to get more of it? And how can you leverage that effectively whilst at the same time uh, respecting the, uh, the, the liability that comes with it. Um, big problem. Uh, from a computer science perspective, very interesting problem because it, it talks to being able to, or needing to deal with each individual event as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as both a trusted issue but a taggable issue. So I know that a person interacted with this product at this time, gave me these permissions, and therefore I'm allowed to use that event information in a certain way. Multiply that by hundreds of thousands of events, and you have a very complicated, uh, very complicated problem, which requires a lot of computation. But it's a it's a very solvable problem. Um, but it's certainly a competence set that brands are going to have to have. Um, at the moment, the internet thing plays very well to uh, close environments. So a closed ecosystem. So if I take Apple, I've now, rather than buy DVDs, I've got films in my iTunes store and I can watch them on multiple devices whenever I want. Um, how do you see, where do you see the other, what other industries? So you think about something like insurance, this is an insurance yeah. company's dream, where they can know the products I own and therefore give me a, you know, a rate based on that. Um, but it strikes me that that's very difficult to achieve for those sorts of industries because they don't have software, they don't have physical products, they can't join the dots. So what do you see as the, um, the kind of soft under that world that starts being these sorts of work first, right from like the plus, right the way that Apple, you know, very much by the GK system? Well, it's, st it's starting to happen slowly. So just to use Nike Plus as a comparison, as a, as a, I guess, a comparable. So Nike of, of the fuel band, is one, <laughs> have taken a closed ecosystem approach, right? So, so they are directly controlling all the data events that occur around this. Whereas Jawbone with UP have taken an open, da da open data approach and, and hence there's a lot of applications that are inter interworking with connecting with, uh, with, with UP. And uh, as a consequence, actually they're getting a richer and richer uh, exploitation of the product um, um, in the market. As, 
And so I think those are early examples of what's possible. You know, it's, it's not an easy thing to, to, have, to, to make work, um, not least because of some of the standards issues of, of data exchange. But more fundamentally, it's actually a philosophy of product design. Um, I was with a car company last week who have this problem whereby they've got a huge amount of data but the flaw in their systems is that they either turn it all on or they turn it all off. <laughs> and so there isn't an easy way to, to share that in a microtransaction type of way um, with third parties. If I want to I want to connect my garage opener to my car so that it knows when I'm when I'm arriving home to open the garage, fantastic. The problem is the garage opener would know absolutely everywhere my car is going at all times, right? Which is therefore not going to work as a, as a viable application. So it's a, it's a the, the hurdle is really a design principle of, of where you start, um, rather than than uh, you know than 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 the, than the ultimate manifestation. I would say, but it's absolutely beginning, and I think it links very directly to the to the data trust issue of. How can a brand prove that it's going to share the information in a way that the consumer feels comfortable to, to, uh, to trust? Because you know, when I check into my TV set to register it, and when I check into my refrigerator to register that, am I OK with the, the idea that the insurance company is going to find out about that and, uh, and make an offer to me? I might be thrilled by the offer. I might not be. Um, so it, th there's, there's, a, there's a whole set of things to do with just establishing the, both the design principles and the, and the ethos of data management that brands have to get their heads around. Sorry, I'm not going to let you go. Um, it's also maybe slightly more mundane questions, but are you seeing any trends in, in product recognition? So whereas high value items, I might you know, check into my, my smart TV. I love the idea of, kind of checking in with my shoes find again, but I'm not sure how I would check in with them. And you've got you know, a few R phones, but they're just a bit nerdy, a bit loopy, or you know, the geeks in here will all sit there and do it, but you know, for, for real people. So is there any in this way you would want to do it? And it's been a bit like that. As a geek, I'm horribly offended. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, the, 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 obviously the holy grail is full object recognition, uh, image object recognition, right? Um, the, 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 the unsolvability of that at this point in time is to do that with most things beyond a label. <laughs> um, that's probably a transitory problem. The real unsolvability is to, is to uniquely recognize something. Because if you can't uniquely recognize something, you can't really qualify its ownership, right? Um, so if I'm using an NFC tag, for example, that's on a, on a, on a product which is a smooth interface in the sense that I just tap it and great, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm able to absolutely authenticate the uniqueness of that item and, and therefore my possession of that specific item. Um, and that's the, so I, I, I just don't believe that's gonna get solved with, uh, with image recognition um, um, for you know, quite a few years. Um, sense of the unique qualification. I think that the, that the object, object recognition is, is being solved and, and will be solved in, over, the, over the course of the next couple of years for an increasing class of, of, of products. Trend-wise, in terms of you know, application behavior, um, it's, it's you know, absolutely image recognition at an SKU level, actually a surprising growth in, in use of QR codes. Because the, the crucial thing is not so much the technology, it's the, it's the motivation for engagement by the consumer, right? Geeks will scan the thing because it's there to be scanned and look, there's a wall plug, what happens if I plug something into it, right? But, but uh, you know, normal people will scan something if there's a clear beneficial motivator. And, uh, and just sticking a QR code in front of a product is not good enough. So there's an increasing amount of, of, uh, of focus on actually what's the digital engagement value proposition. Okay, out of time. <laughs> One, one question, yeah? I speak uh, from a consumer point of view. What if I don't want the brand to speak to me, and not too often? Uh, so I come from a telecom company, and I can assure you that we, we actually know what they do. We actually know when they use the phone, where they call, uh, and everything that, we have tons of data. Uh, but, the, but the ratio of how many, what typical percentage conversion of, conversion of whatever you do is basically three to five percent. So that means that you are always talking to 95 people every time who are not interested in what mm -hmm. you are telling them. Uh, so what about, I mean, I come from that point of view. Uh, 
say you have lots of information, the brand has lots of information on what the consumer is doing. Maybe the consumer doesn't want, want them to know about it, number two, not to disturb them. That they so the, I think that gets uh, just to the, the, the brand trust issue, right? People have to be able to opt out of what they are sharing. Um, they, the, the flip side of that is that they're going to have to pay for, uh, for the value that they're not delivering back to the brand, right? Um, and and uh, so that, you know, and that's the trade-off that exists right now uh, on, online. Um, and that will manifest itself with the product. But, uh, you know, I, th I think that there's a, just a huge question on brands' ability to prove that they can be trusted with data, both in how they use it and how they don't use it, right? Um, and, and absolutely, consumers have to be able to just say, I want to be offline and, uh, and, and, and believe that. Okay, out of time. Thank you very much.